you for uh, presenting this week at quite short notice, or very short notice to be honest, um, and we are grateful for him uh, for doing that. Hugh is currently teaching at the London College of Communication on sports journalism, and he's the author of several authoritative books on rugby history, including The Red and the White, which tells not mine. <laughs> the history of English and Welsh rugby, The Dragons and All Blacks, which is the story of New Zealand and Welsh rugby, and a general history of rugby union, and going for hooligans. Um, and he's going to be talking, as well as lots and lots of journalism, of course, and he's going to be talking to us about the bounce of the century, um, which is an account of the Wales People's series in 1953, the text, I should say. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it was 63 and a half years ago today, which is not a rejected early draft of Sergeant Pepper, but an actual description of where we are in relation to the last time Wales were over wax on the 19th of December 1953 at Cardiff Park. Of course, it's passing rather from living memory. Any spectator with any real memory will now be 70 or more, and there are only four players left. Uh, three New Zealanders, the centre John Tanner, scrum half Keith Davis and the back row Will McCall, and a single Welshman, the prop Courtney Meredith. I don't know what it tells you, but Meredith was the only person who declined to be interviewed when I did Dragons and All Blacks, particularly when you consider that the only two members of the England 1966 World Cup team I've met are the two who died. So I should probably be avoided, <laughs> um, which you knew that already. And of course this seminar is largely devoted to new research by bright young scholars, and today you get old research by a rather faded old journal. But I thought I would think a little bit about actually the process of writing the book. Which, sorry, which? I think you Thank you, yeah, right, yeah. And it was inspired by a conversation with David Kinniston about his book, WG's Birthday Party, which I imagine some of you would know. Um, it's a minor gem which took the 1898 Gents Players match at Lords, which was also 1898 WG Grace's 50th birthday, and used it to reconstruct not only the events of the historic match, but examined the context of the match and in particular the lives of the players. That conversation was in the early 1990s, and it got on from that to, could, is there a rugby match you could do it with? And if so, which one? And David suggested Obolinsky's match, which is the famous defeat of the All Blacks by England in 1936, and I could see that, but there were two issues. It was already a bit long since it had happened. Um, we're, now, yeah, we're talking for 55, 56 years. And it was also an England win, so it didn't do much for me personally. But Wales beating the All Blacks in 1953, a different matter, so that's how it starts. Didn't then happen for a while. I had a full-time job on the Times higher, and that didn't really provide the time necessary for research and writing. But in the early 2000s, a freelance contract with the FT gave me the basic security and also, and also flexibility over time, which made it possible. And of course, the 50th anniversary of the match was looming. Um, this isn't a hugely scientific and rigorous piece of research. It's not, for instance, footnoted. Um, I simply laid my hands on everything I could find about the game. And the key to it um, was interviews with the surviving players from the match, and there were then 10 on each side. Um, importantly, of course, the interviews in New Zealand, where I got an enormous amount of help from Bob Howitt, a veteran New Zealand journalist, who supplied me with phone numbers and addresses, and I wrote to them by airmail. It's that long ago. <laughs> I actually got to see all ten of them, plus two more members of the squad who happened along a player's house because it was an international weekend and there was a reunion, plus Sir Terry McLean, who was a journalist who had been a member of the tour party and had written a book about it. Of the Welsh, also ten, I got eight. Meredith they declined. Ken Jones, a scorer of the decisive try, who suffered a stroke and wasn't capable of being interviewed. I also spoke to Glyn Davis who was picked to play in the match but forced to pull out in the morning, and by phone for the paperback edition to Brian Sparks, who was, res who was reserved for but didn't get to play, in spite of the fact that Davis, who had dropped out, was also a back row forward. What I found through this process was that the story changed. You could say it started off to use some of the terminology from a couple of weeks ago as a vaguely na nationalistic project, given that it was about our great Welsh victory. But I realised that the better story was actually that of the New Zealanders. And a part of that, of course, is Pete Hamill's quote, that the best stories are always in the loser's locker room. But there was more than the experiences. The Welsh players played in the match 
and although it may have been the most memorable of their match, life of their match, went home and slept in their own bed, or at least a Welsh bed, that night. The New Zealanders, by contrast, had left home nine weeks before and would not be home for another three months. Now, of course, that wouldn't occasion much comment nowadays among the New Zealanders, um, where a much longer time away has become built into life cycles as an overseas experience. But this, of course, is a very different world. Brian Fitzpatrick, father of Sean, uh, who made his debut in this match, said, we were a bunch of young guys who were seeing life, in our case, very much for the first time. I was quite, actually quite happy about that. I didn't want to do a work of nationalist tribalism, <coughs> but one which considered both countries equally. I knew, among other things, that New Zealanders buy rugby books, in fact, rather more than Welsh people do. And it's one of the great frustrations, along with the delays that meant that the book ended up coming out in 2004, after the 50th anniversary, it never did get published in New Zealand. It was generally well received and shortlisted for the William Hill Prize, but it was in the same year as, my, as Gary in Black's My <coughs> Father and Other Working Class Football Heroes, so it wasn't going to win. Julie didn't. Though Gary and I do share an agent, so he was happy. It's been revisited twice, once the following year for the paperback, and then a few years ago for the Kindle edition. And in both cases, that led to some revisions, mostly to the final chapter, because in both cases, it's actually quite a long time ago. That match in 1953 is part of a vastly different rugby world. It's still amateur, at least nominally, and there's a pattern of tours, which is that the major southern hemisphere nations would come roughly once a decade, provided there wasn't a war, and when they did come, they'd stay for much of the season, playing 25 to 30 matches, as well as the internationals. New Zealand arrived in 1905, 1924, 1935, and of course 1953. South Africa, 1906, 1912, 1931, 1951. Australia, 1908, 1927, when they, when they come as New South Wales, because rugby in Queensland is more or less dormant, with singular ill timing in September 1939, when they more or less go straight back home, fearing they're gonna be torpedoed all the way back, and in 1947. That picture, by the way, is the uh, All Blacks doing the haka at the international at the international against Wales at St Helens, Swansea, in 1924. Um, of course, nowadays they're here every autumn, but they only play international matches. And but what hasn't changed was that the Southern nations were pretty dominant, or at least South Africa and New Zealand were. South Africa lost their first Test match in Britain against the Scots in 1906. Did not then lose another Test match until in Britain, or Britain and Ireland until 1965. New Zealand in 1905 win every match except the 3-0 loss to Wales, which I'll come back to again in a moment. In 1924 they win every match. Rather sadly they don't play Scotland, who were at their peak at the time, so that's a genuine loss. Um, they'd probably have won, but it would have, been good to see Scot um, would have been good to see Scotland's best ever team try. In 1935 they win every match except against Swansea, Wales, England, and they draw with Ulster. And of course, in terms of the theme of this term, it is an expression of empire. You know, it isn't a fluke that the leading overseas rugby nations are three of the four white settler dominions. Canada, the fourth, of course, is rather more in sporting terms in the orbit of the United States. Australia at this stage is not really terribly competitive. And South Africa has to put it mildly in equivocal relationship with the empire. New Zealand, though, has no such qualms. Um, it saw itself, as in the phrase James Belich had used, a better Britain. And there were slogans proclaiming it's 98.5% British. It is, of course, nonsense. Nowhere is that homogeneous, not even Britain. But it was an important part of the self image. Walter Nash, the former Prime Minister and leader of the opposition, speaking to the 1953 All Blacks as they left tells them, remember, you are going home, you are leaving home to go home. And New Zealand is, economically is governed by what Belich has called recolonialism. It's an economy dependent on agricultural exports, uh, particularly meat and dairy products to Britain. Two thirds of New Zealand's trade at this time is with Britain. The treatment of the native population is held up overseas as a model. And this, of course, concealed the truth. The main reason why the Maori were better treated than Australia's native people was that they'd been much more fiercely resistant. Um, as warriors, they were not only brave and resourceful, but sophisticated, and had tied down large parts of the British Army in the 1860s and retained the degree of autonomy in the king country until the first years of the 20th century. 
New Zealand in 1953, a population of 2 million, um, so less than half what it is now. It's culturally conservative. Warwick Roger remembered a rural, flat mental and social landscape. And Jock Phillips has described the 1950s as the triumph of the New Zealand media stereotype built around the holy trinity of rugby, racing and beer. Pubs still shot at 6pm, leading to the most spectacular drunken sessions between the, uh, between the end of work and closing time, and there was fierce debate about whether women should be allowed into bars at all. And changes on the way. Canadian Pacific in 1953 had announced that they were the first direct flights to Vancouver the following year, which is the beginning of the process which will transform New Zealanders from the most, world's most isolated Europeans, at least in terms of origin, to the world's great travellers. But you're still some time away from that. Um, a prominent Auckland family expression of their, uh, um, impressions of their visits to Britain was still worth a little bit of space in the features pages of the New, of the, sorry, the New Zealand Herald. Rugby has, an, has a huge place in this. Um, Bellich, um, rather a play on words, what better way to be better Britain than by being better than Britain at the most British of games? Probably, tell, probably the issue is a breathalyzer test. Belich argues that football is more or less universal, so it's not anybody's, and cricket is essentially English. But this is that one. And the All Blacks have a historic role in creating New Zealand's sense of identity. First tour of, of Britain, which of course then includes Ireland and France in 1905. It's then a new country. Nowadays, New Zealand tends, not without reason, to treat the Waitangi Treaty of 1840 as its date of foundation. But it only definitively decided to set out off by itself when it rejected membership of the Australian Federation in 1900, and Dominion status was not to come along until 1907. Keith Sinclair said that troops in world, that New Zealand troops in World War I were the first people to be self-consciously New Zealanders, since contact with other troops made them think about what made them not Australians and not British. But the All Blacks had made an impact on the world nine years earlier. And one of the things that came out of 1905 is a relationship with Wales. They go through the rest of Britain and Ireland like a devouring flame. And Scotland at least gave them a decent game before losing 12-7. Um, they beat England 15-0. And the record in England was one to play 23-123 for 721 points against 15. <laughs> there was... Quite a lot of criticism of the way they played with the New Zealand formation of an extra, essentially an extra halfback, the Rover, who was drawn from the pack, and a seven man scrum. Heavily criticised, but there was a very simple issue they were simply much too good. Until they hit Wales, they didn't, simply didn't run up into opposition of comparable seriousness and low cunning. An example of which being that Wales, which had not previously used that formation, picked a Rover. For the, for the test match, and also met up beforehand to practice, which is very much what British rugby players didn't do in 1905. The match, I think it can be argued, is unique in sports history. It creates a dual foundation myth. I'd be interested to know if anybody can come up with another one. New Zealand, the new country, Wales, the old one. But Wales has been transformed economically, socially and linguistically by the industrialisation of the previous half century. We're used to thinking of South Wales as depressed and impoverished, but at this time it's still dynamic and fast growing, very different to what it had been in 50 to 60 years before. It's actually a meeting of two of the fastest growing, most dynamic economies on earth, harder than that maybe to believe now. Um, that transformation in Wales changes Welsh identity and diversifies it, not least through heavy migration from the West Country and the Midlands. The Welsh captain in 1905, Gwyn Nichols, was born in the forest of Dean, but in the words of Gareth Williams, was a West Countryman by birth, but Welsh by adoption, inclination and location. And he was not alone in that. The match itself, and so those, those pictures are the pictures of the, of the two teams. It's the first rugby match which was recognised, described beforehand, as the de facto world championship. And it turns on two events. Um, the first is the Welsh try, scored by the wing Teddy Morgan, from a pre-planned move in which scrum half Dickie Owen, who previously completely ignored the rover, 
broke to the right of the scrum, then re reversed past to the rover, creating an overlap from which Morgan scored. Just gave Wales a 3 0 lead. And that's the final score, but it's not what's remembered about this match. That comes in the later stages when the New Zealand centre Bob Deans is, to put it as neutrally as I can, held at the Welsh line. Um, it's rugby's equivalent of Jeff Hurst's goal in the 1966 World Cup final, with the important difference that it wasn't given. And it creates a similar debate, of which Rhys Gabe, a member of the 1905 Welsh team, was to write in 1953. The longer this incident recedes into antiquity, the more nebulous becomes the truth about it. But of course, what it means is each country can take something from this game. Wales have won. New Zealand's got this legend of an unbeaten team brought down by unfortunate refereeing. Gareth Williams, the leading Welsh histor historian of Welsh rugby, sees this at the point at which rugby becomes, in his phrase, a preeminent expression of Welsh consciousness and a signifier of Welsh nationhood. Keith Sinclair has called it New Zealand sports equivalent of Gallipoli. Every single member of those 1953 All Blacks, all 12 of them, grew up on that legend. And most of them actually would raise it before I did when I interviewed them. <coughs> Wales is much less conscious. Cliff Morgan is certainly aware of 1905 and talks about it. I suspect that others such as Levin Williams and John William probably did, but it clearly isn't as much in the foreground. It's very, very, it's very, very important for New Zealand. The All Blacks come back in 1924, when they find Wales in their worst period before the 1990s, and they win 19-0. 1935, as we've seen already, they lose, to, they lose the first time to a club team when they lose at Swansea, I think that bears repeating, and to Wales. So the first three All Blacks team play 93 matches, and they lose four. Three of them in Wales and two of them two Wales. And that does create a relationship. And it's the connection between the two nations in which rugby is a vital element, perhaps arguably the only element. And I think if nations are an imagined community, right, there's a case of saying that Wales and New Zealand is in some ways an imagined relationship. It's very rare, if you think about it, for people from Wales and New Zealand to meet except in times of war or on a rugby field. Wales, unlike other Celtic cultures, is defined by immigration and not emigration. There are not vast numbers of Welsh people abroad. There were Welsh migrants in New Zealand, but we don't know a huge amount about them. Um, because the problem, the problem with that being that they, England and Wales were literally the same, so they were not differentiated, but they certainly weren't remotely in the numbers from the other parts of Britain. Bellich estimates that of white New Zealanders between 1860 and 1950, based on the research of the Canadian Don Bakinson, 52% gave them England and Wales, 21 to 24% in Scotland, 16 to 18% Irish. When I asked him to make a guess at the last numbers, he reckoned 2%. Now, if the England and Wales figure had been 53%, he might have said 3%. But you get the general idea. And you know, the Welsh are very, comparatively very small. Now, I think this has a serious impact on perceptions in New Zealand. If you're a Scottish New Zealander, an English New Zealander is somebody you encounter frequently, and he probably goes to a different church and votes a different way. But a Welsh New Zealander, on the other hand, you know, the Welsh are these people on the other side of the world who love rugby as much as New Zealanders, who take it seriously and play it as well. And to a degree, the converse applies. The, the, it's based in a sense on, I think, on image much more than actual context. So that's the context in which the game takes place in 1953. First international of that tour, although by that stage they'd been in Britain for two months and they played 13 matches. And the first All Black team to travel to New Europe by air, which took them four and a half days and any number of stops, of which I didn't get a complete list, but included Basra, Jakarta, Zurich, actually probably roughly in that order. It would be probably about a dozen stops. So it's a little, it's a little bit of a um, marathon, but of course compared to six weeks on the boat, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty rapid. What they hadn't done as a team in the early parts of the tour was made much of an impression, with the exception of the fullback Bob Scott, who's photographed here at the beginning of the tour, kicking barefooted. Um, and was described by one writer, the team was described by one writer as lacking in first principles, except for Scott, who is several principles in himself. 
they still usually won. And they played with some style, for instance, in beating Clonetley in their first match in Wales, they won 14 3. But they've been beaten by Cardiff, who are at this point arguably at their all time peak as a club. And the week before the Wales game, they drew at Swansea, who were actually some way short of being their best ever. New Zealand team, whose signatures are on the left hand side well, the, of, the, of the ones I interview, um, they're fairly representative of their country. The largest occupational group are those involved in agriculture. There are three farmers in the front five, and the captain, Bob Stewart, is an agricultural scientist who rather delighted his team by being caught, by being caught on his hands and knees checking the quality of the grass in Windsor Great Park. Six of them have been to university, which would obviously be comparatively much greater than the graduate share of the population, and Hooker Ron Hemi was taking accountancy exams. There were four Roman Catholics, including three from one school, St Kevin's Omaru. Kevin Skinner, prop forward who was one of those alumni, pointed to the number of priests who coached rugby. And there's an echo here of Michael Green's comment in the Art Course Rugby about the risk of playing against seminary students because they had all those energies that most rugby players devoted to drinking and pursuing women in sort of rugby or sublimation. One Maori in the team, scrum half Keith Davis, but he didn't lead the haka. Um, he was rather self-conscious about it. And also has quite an instant, he was actually part Irish. Because um, he got, he said he got raised to people in, in Wales asking, he called Davis, he got Welsh ancestry, no, it was Irish. He'd actually had ancestors on both sides in the Battle of Gate Park, which is one of the important battles in the New Zealand War. And there's one single glorious anomaly. There's one coal miner playing in this match. And he's not, as you might assume, a Welsh forward, but New Zealand's outside half, Laurie Haig, who's also the one emigrant in the, in the All Black team, as a Scotland in Scotsman. Wales 2, on the right hand side there, on the right way, um, have their counterintuitive development. They have five players who were educated at public school, and three of them are forwards. And there's also a prop, Courtney Meredith, who has a cut glass accent although he has a distinctly unpretentious background from Clarence in the, in the Neath Valley. The rest of the pack were a little bit more than you'd expect. Uh, there was a former miner who became a policeman at Hooker, Di Davis, and the steel worker, um, Billy Stoker Williams, completed the front row. The back row had two teachers, and there were lots of teachers. Two teaching in private schools, two in the state system, one student teacher, obviously all very much part of the Welsh stereotype, the great Welsh exports for steel, coal and schoolmasters, and one doctor. Three who are employed in family businesses which they would eventually inherit. Five of the seven backs, um, both the half backs, and three of three quarters were from Cardiff. And literally you have one player who's eligible for England, the Win Win, -win Rowlands, who's also the doctor, um, was eligible for England and actually had a trial for them in 1949, occasioning a family rift which led to his mother expelling his father from the family bedroom. Then he said, his dad said to him afterwards, for Christ's sake, next time you offer him a game, get offered a game, take it. But only one, only one player actually playing in England, which actually in a sense is a sign of the state of the Welsh economy by then, that there were jobs in Wales which there hadn't been between the wars, where at one stage more than half of the players in the last final trial of playing their rugby in England. Um, it's a period of comparative prosperity. Population of Wales at this time is 2.6 million, roughly the same as being in 1931. Unemployment is only 25,000, which is uh, still high by British standards. It's one seventh of the British total, um, but it's vastly lower than it had been in the interwar period. I would think there were pretty comfortably more than 25,000 people out of work in Merthyr Tidville, never mind the whole of Wales. 20 years earlier. So there's full employment, um, new investment represented by projects like the Abbey Works at Margam, which opened in 1951, and there were still 100,000 coal miners. That's down from 250,000 in the 1930s, but it's the mi miners are still a significant, if declining, element in the Welsh economy and Welsh society. What Wales lacks is the signifiers of nationhood. Some years later, I think in the late 50s, W. John Morgan would argue that picking the national rugby team is the nearest we get to self-government. 
had had in 1951 the appointment of the first minister for Wales, uh, David Maxwell Fife, who was rapidly renamed Di Bananas. There still isn't a capital city. Cardiff is elevated in 1955, which to West Walian eyes is entirely uncoincidentally also the year in which international matches cease to be shared with Swansea. Just over a quarter of the population is Welsh speaking, but not many rugby players. There wasn't a single Welsh speaker as the BBC discovers their horror um, when they look for somebody to talk to their Welsh speaking audience in 1950 when Wales won the Grand Slam in Belfast. Um, but there is, there is the old Gareth Griffiths, the centre, is a Welsh speaker in this team. Clinetley, but in a sense, in terms of the state of rugby, Clinetley is still being spelt by, with a Y on their scoreboard, not the I. Biggest difference nowadays, Wales expected to win. It's a very strong period for Welsh rugby. There are two generally accepted golden ages, the 1900s and the 1970s. David Parry Jones has made a strong case for a third in the 1950s. There are grand slams in 1950 and 1952. Wales are usually in contention for the title for much of the decade, generally with either England or France as the alternative. And of course there is this match as well. Wales at this point are 2-1 up on New Zealand all time. It's true of course New Zealand had won the only clear cut match, but there's no assumption of all black superiority. And this of course is not seen as a vintage all black, all black team. They'd struggled in Wales, and the week before, a BBC commentator predicted that Wales would win by 10 points. So if we come on to the match itself, and again, that's a, that's a match ticket, 15, 15 shillings for a stamp ticket. Um, 57,000 in the crowd, of whom all but 7,000 were standing. And... It's a grand, notorious for appalling playing conditions. There's a remarkable history of England Wales games played in quite unspeakable, generally wet conditions, not least because the level of the playing area was actually below the, was below the level of the River Taff next door. So if, basically if it rained enough, the ground would flood. But the conditions on this occasion were fine. It's cold, but bright and dry, as I hope we will see, um, if we can get the um, film of the match to show you in a minute. But the 57,000 crowd do, did what Welsh people tended to do in these days when compelled to hang around and waiting large numbers, they sang. And the radio broadcast in New Zealand was started 15 minutes before kickoff so that people in New Zealand, where it's 2.15am, could listen to the singing. And actually the singing, I, by the 90s, I strongly suspected that there was an element of legend about the quality of the singing at the Arms Park. But clearly in 1953 it was genuinely rather good. It does sound like a very, very large choir. Um, it's the first international match to be televised in the UK, but only fragments, which I hope you'll see in a minute, remain. And the British National Sound Archive only retains highlights. Interestingly enough, there is a complete recording, I think this tells you something about relative attitudes to rugby, in the New Zealand National Sound Archive, although I'm not totally sure if the original still exists, since the archive was in the centre of Christchurch. And I rather wonder if the giant discs on which it was recorded would have survived the earthquake. Or well, there will obviously, of course, be recordings, but whether the discs were made. It. The match itself would appear rather bitty to modern eyes. There are 75 line-outs, with the wingers throwing in rather than the hooker. These are frequently followed by a scrum, knock-on or some other offence, there are 53 scrums, which, of which 20 had to be reset. 85 stoppages in all in the first half. But the other difference is what is that they would set up very, very rapidly compared to the amount of time um, <coughs> taken nowadays. So it's very stop-start, but there's a very high tempo. They're not taking a minute and a half to put a scrum together. It's played with a heavy leather ball, players wearing leather boots. What we haven't yet had is a rule change that's opened the game up in the later 1950s and 1960s. There's very little space in the field. Dribbling is still a serious skill for forwards, essentially because of the lack of space. And the direct kick to touch, tap, sorry, to touch is still allowed. Scoring is low by modern standards. It's still only three points for a try. This match eventually would have 21 points. Now that's comparatively high scoring. Only one of the ten matches in the Five Nations played in the first few months of 1954 
shortly after this game had more than 21 points, and the average number of points in those games was around 15. So it might, 38 might not seem like a trial fest, but by the standards of the time, it is pretty, pretty high school. At this stage, if we can get, uh, we can bring up the YouTube, and this, this is the film of the match. The All Blacks kick off against Wales at Cardiff Farms Park, straight into a dazzling sun that won't help them much in this rugby classic. Now for some of the stuff that 56,000 people have come to see. Brisk, bustling attacking by the New Zealanders, and stubborn do-or-die defence by the Welshmen. Soon the pattern of play changes as the Welshman make a run for the All Blacks line. Judd pounces onto the loose ball, and he touches down for Wales. Bryn Rowlands converts to make it 5-0. Bob Scott leads the All Blacks back on an attack, but it's no easy task to break through one of the most resolute defences Wales has ever put up. It's a tough match, all right, with no quarter asked or given. But now an infringement gives the All Blacks a chance of scoring. Jordan takes the penalty. the All Blacks, fighting every inch of the way to level the score. The Welshmen see trouble coming their way as Clark gets the ball and bursts through the defence to touch down for New Zealand. But that's not all. Jordan puts it over the bar for another couple of points. That makes it 8-5 in the visitors' favour at half-time. Things look bad for Wales, but here they go again. Recently, critics have had a lot to say about rough play on the rugby field, but they hadn't much to complain about today. Though so now an all-black infringes the rules and Wales gets another chance. Rowlands takes the penalty, and the scores are level, eight points each. Despite the stories of the mighty all-blacks pack, the Welshmen seem to be holding them well. Well smiles soon vanish as Griffiths has to leave the field with a dislocated shoulder. But they can't keep him away for long. He's soon back in action, helping out as the all-blacks attack with everything they've got. swing play round again. They're getting their second win now. Rowlands gets it, but Elson is there to walk him. Clem Thomas races in to pick up. Thomas punts it across the field, where Ken Jones is ready and waiting. Jones has it safe and sound, and over he goes. A perfect touchdown that gives Wales a solid lead in the last few minutes of the match. Rowlands takes the conversion, two more points for Wales. There's no further score, so Wales have done it by 13 points to eight. But there's one more battle to be fought, for the ball. John wins it, but hands it over to Scott, the All Blacks go back. A sporting gesture to end the great day of sport. Bob's, um, I did actually ask Bob Scott about whether he'd still got the ball, and he said, no, I haven't got it, and I've never had it. So quite what happens to quite what happens to that ball is a matter of a matter of some interest. Presumably he's probably in somebody's attic somewhere. Or be, or be, or be, or be chewed to death by somebody's book. Um, anyway, so, so what, a few points about the game. It's actually a game New Zealand should probably have won. Contrary to what the report said, their forwards were actually top in a long period, and as we've seen, they were eight five up at half time. And there were three decisive moments, all in the second half. And the film actually gets the first two out of order. Um, Gareth, Griff Le Gareth Griffiths going off in the 50th minute with a dislocated shoulder, because there were no replacements in those days. Um, he goes off the field, and the Welsh medical officer, Nathan Rossin Jones, tells him to lie in a blanket on the sidelines and puts his shoulder back. Uh, yeah, the I, I was told by Green Rowlands, the doctor said they, what you had to do was it ha you had to put the shoulder back immediately put the shoulder back immediately. Not pleasant, but it could be done, otherwise you'd have to wait and have an operation. The other thing that Rowland said was that was undoubtedly very, very brave. But Wales are without Gareth Griffiths for ten to fifteen minutes, scrambling desperately, and New Zealand pressing. But New Zealand don't get through, and Wales of course get a huge morale boost when Gareth Griffiths comes back. And it's parallel oddly enough here with the 1935 game, which Wales actually finished with 14 men after the hooker Dom, Dom Tarr broke his neck in the scrub. Um, Levin Williams, the Welsh captain, said 
made one hell of a difference having Griffiths back. Pressure's lifted, Wales after that long period are still in the game. Then Wales attack in the 72nd minute, and look, you see where they've gone out badly out of order. Bill Clark, who scored, course, scored in the first half, making his debut for New Zealand, was penalised for lying on the ball. Essentially, he was trapped in a ruck. It was a pretty tough decision. 16 years later, Clem Thomas, on his tour on a tour of New Zealand with Wales, told Clark the penalty should not have been awarded. Um, but it was, and it was still rankled nearly 50 years later with the survivors of that team. Uh, Wynne Rowlands, who's another debutant, who's actually his 25th birthday as well, scores at 8 all. And at this stage, a draw, which is much commoner than one might in those days and it is now, looked pretty likely given how infrequently promised to score. That picture, by the way, is of, which I suspect isn't very clear, is of Brian Fitzpatrick. Um, being foiled at the Welsh line by Gerwin Williams, the Welsh fullback. But of course, by this state, Wales have momentum. Um, and you saw the pictures there. Clem Thomas, who's hemmed in on the touchline by tacklers, opts to kick across the field. And there's a whole range of myth and legend around this. Um, it has been alleged that the Welsh touch judge, Ivan Jones, himself a legend of British Lion, had shouted him to kick. It's also been argued that the one thing Clem would never do was anything he'd actually been told to. Um, other people see it as simple blind panic under pressure, but one journalist did point out that Thomas had set up a try against France the previous year with the cross kick. And the ball bounced across the field to where the two fastest players on the pitch, New Zealand's Ron Jardim and Wales's Ken Jones, who'd been a medalist in the relay at the 1948 Olympics, converge on it. They're both at full tilt. They're both committed, and essentially the person, one who gets there first, is probably going to score at either end. Certainly, because certainly had Jardim got there first, with Jones committed, it's unlikely anybody else would have caught him, even though he had 80 yards to go. Jones get, as you've seen, Jones get there first and scores. Uh, the picture behind, behind me. And Wilfred Wooler, former Welsh player on the radio, rather excitedly proclaims that Wales, that's the winning score for Wales. Ignoring the fact there's actually still four or five minutes left to play. Rowlands convert. The All Blacks this stage are a score down uh, with four or five minutes to go. Because nowadays you regard yourself as having a decent shot at getting back into the game. You've seen the All Blacks do it once or twice. Um, on the rare occasions they are behind with four or five minutes to go. But of course in a time of scarce scoring it's very different and they need a try and conversion just to draw. The All Blacks press, Wales defend fairly desperately but they hang on and they win 38. Now it says something about the different levels of expectation that Levin Williams, the Welsh captain, was actually disappointed. He felt Wales hadn't played very well and probably not deserved to win and they'd played not nearly as well as Cardiff had done, also his club, when they beat them a few weeks earlier. And I think of course Levin could afford to be choosy because he had that victory for Cardiff. John Gwillem, who was his predecessor as Welsh captain, pointed out they had scored two tries to one and a coach appeared with 14 men and that frankly any win over New Zealand was worth celebrating. The Daily Telegraph verdict was that intuitive skill won the game, won the day for Wales. The dinner was over by eight o'clock. This is possibly a consequence of what had happened in 1935 when celebrating players had more, had more or less demolished the hotel. Um, so the consequence was the Welsh players went home Gwyn Rowlands is back in a hut at RAF St Athens. Stoker Williams is on the shift at Garrison Steelworks the following morning. Rest of the tour, New Zealand go on to beat Wales, sorry, go on to beat England, Ireland and Scotland before going down to France. And that's the result that probably seals their fate as being regarded as not a great All Blacks team. There's no shame at the time in losing to Wales. And they had no way of knowing that France was about to become, for most of the next half century, the strongest team in Europe. It was assumed that the All Blacks would beat them. It's not quite England losing to Iceland at football, but there is an element of that. The historian Lindsay Knight describes it as being remembered as a tragedy. Because if anybody had been told in 1953 that Wales would not have beaten New Zealand again in 2017, they'd have been shot even if they'd assumed that that once a decade pattern would be maintained on the basis of which, of course, there'd only been six more games. Instead, of course, there'd been 29 of them. Now, Wales were competitive in the 1970s, 
1972, they lost 1916 at Cardiff in a match where New Zealand were hanging on desperately in the end. In 1978, Wales lost 13-12. They were leading 12-10 in the last minute when the last block, Jeff Wheel, was penalised for leaning on his all-black opposite number, Frank Oliver, in the lineup. At the same lineup, the all-black lock, Andy Hayden, hurled himself to the ground in a dramatic piece of diving that the penalty was given for the offence by Jeff Wheel. I had talked to the referee, I talked to Jeff, um, Roger Quinton, the referee, about that, so we'll not talk about that later. Um, happy to do that. The better side lost, but as the 1953 All Blacks all pretty much saw it, this was quite a quid pro quo for the penalty given against them in 1953. And of course, what it does leave is the great asterisk against those Welsh teams in the 1970s. They couldn't beat the All Blacks, although they did have two shots in home matches and another one in 1975 when somehow the Welsh Rugby Union found an excuse for not giving it for international status. But the divide opens in 1980. The All Blacks win 23-3 at Cardiff in the match for the centenary of the Welsh Rugby Union. And again, it's an interesting point there, that centenary year, it was always going to be the All Blacks that they played. And that gap starts to yawn at their next meeting, which is not till 1987. Um, the World Cup semi-final in Australia, uh, New Zealand win 49-6. And this match has created confusion ever since for my precise rugby credentials, because the Neath Lock Hugh Richards was sent off, having first that and actually had the singular distinction that he had to be revived to be sent off because he, having hit a New Zealander, the New Zealander's even larger mate knocked him out. So probably not one of the more embarrassing sendings off. Now, if we include that match, over the last 30 years, Wales have played New Zealand 22 times. Uh, the average score in those matches is, New, is with a bit, little bit of rounding up, New Zealand 40, Wales 13. I've been at about 10 of them, all with Wales as the home team, and I think I probably believed in all that time, it's 800 minutes of rugby on the clock, probably nearer to 900, 950 in total. Sorry, one, there was the World Cup game in 2003 as well, which is in Australia. But um, I suspect I believed in all that time for about 10 minutes that Wales might win. And that was in 2014, uh, before Rhys Webb was injured. And New Zealand ended up winning that 34-16. And they're playing again in Cardiff in November. I dare say, I should, I should probably feel I'd rather have to go, because I'll be, I'll be bloody mad if they win when I'm not there. Um, and, you know, I, would, I wouldn't put money on it, or you get very good odds, but, you know, this is where it is still something you would want, one would want to see. I suppose we to come on to this point. Um, I'm pretty disappointed which we really do go from uh, academic research to journalistic speculation. Uh, why has this happened? Very, so the very simple crude point to be made about relative population. Um, New Zealand's winning run against Wales starts in 1963 and it overtakes Wales' population in 1964 or 1965. I really wish they'd got there a couple of years earlier because it would have been terribly neat if you could have made this precise demographic connection, say, yeah, there's more of them. Uh, New Zealand now, though, of course, has 4.8 million people to 3.1 million people in Wales. That's quite an appreciable difference. New Zealand has more rugby players, and that's always tricky to know exactly who or what is being counted, but the world rugby figures for registered players, so New Zealand with 150,000 players to 83,000 in Wales. New Zealand's population has changed and you've had an influx of Polynesians. There were 8,000 islanders in New Zealand in 1956, 200,000 by 1996, heavily concentrated in Auckland. The number of Samoan males in New Zealand is greater than the population of Samoa. This has had an impact, this has had an impact in a very real sense of that word. As anybody who's seen a Samoan or Tongan tackling will tell you. I think if you tried to design a rugby player from first principles, you'd get a Samoan. And of course, rugby has this immensely important place in New Zealand society. New Zealand is a great sporting society. It produces top class formers in a number of sports, sailing notably. If you look at the America's Cup going on at the moment, it's got a decent cricket team. 
it actually takes women's sport seriously. It's one of the top nations in netball. When I first going there in 1987, I was surprised and very impressed by the amount of space given to netball in newspapers. Women's rugby started relatively late. Uh, they rapidly became the best team in the world, and they've only now been overtaken by an England team um, who are, and England have done that actually by putting serious resources into it, in creating a professional squad. The prime sporting talent in New Zealand still goes into rugby. It's a sport that has prestige and it provides a good living. New Zealand handled the transition to professionalism relatively smoothly in the mid 1990s. There are concerns about their losses to the rich leagues in England and France, but so far they've shown the ability to generate talent faster than they lose it. And we can obviously point to examples like Nick Evans, a player's very fine players who've played over here. Um, but the very, very best players, the likes of Daniel Carter, choose to play their prime years as all blacks rather than go abroad. I was obviously aware that Carter was a bit of an exception, he played a year abroad. But the very they, what they tend to lose is a bit of depth. We have still to see a an all black player in their prime with an international future. Um, leave in order for better money abroad. And then there's New Zealand rugby culture. Everybody who ever goes, particularly on a rugby sort of New Zealand, comments on the level of knowledge you'll find across the whole of New Zealand society. And there are countless anecdotes about old ladies with highly informed views about where you put your feet in the scrum. There's a basic rugby literacy about New Zealand. It often strikes me as a you know, years as a journalist, you see New Zealand players make mistakes. You very re really rarely see them doing anything that's plain and done. It's a contrast with Wales, and not just in that respect. Wales, of course, hasn't had that demographic transfusion that New Zealanders enjoyed from the Islanders. Hence, perhaps, Graham Henry's plan when he was coach of Wales to import schoolboys from New Zealand and South Africa and get them qualified for Wales. Wales lost its historic underpinnings from heavy industry, with the coal and steel industry disappearing, and the public services, notably teaching and the police, rather struggled in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, again, we're also probably having a slightly different demographic uh, set up to Scotland and um, Scotland and Ireland, where it's got, in fact, in, similarly with the, with the Exiles clubs. London, Scotland, and London Irish are full of, are full of lawyers and accountants. Um, London Welsh players tend, tend to be teachers. Wales was actually quite relaxed about professionalism. It was always the well, British Union that was most receptive to the idea there should be some form of rule of play. But it struggled with it rather badly. And of course, very simply, <coughs> it's a small, not very wealthy country. In the key period of transition after 1995, energy and resources went into the construction of a new stadium. It's worth noting that Wales was the only country that felt necessary to do that before hosting a World Cup. In spite of the fact that it staged a lower percentage of games in 1999 than any other host nation has done, and it's since prioritised the paying off the consequent debt over other things, impoverishing the game below international level as being not so much the Millennium Stadium as the Millstone. There was a search for King Arthur-like saviours, returning rugby league players, coaches from New Zealand, and they eventually settled on genetic engineering and the creation of regional franchises. The record there has been frankly mixed. The franchises have a poor playing record in European competition, and it effectively disfranchised the Valleys, <coughs> even though Pontypridd had been the best supported club in Wales in the period up to regionalisation. We have seen revival in the fortunes of the national team since 2005, three Grand Slams in 2005, 2008 and 2012, and a semi-final in the World Cup in 2011. Not so much a golden age as rather as gold-plated, because it's become, they've been rather inconsistent. Wales were also in the bottom half every year they didn't win the Grand Slam between 2005 and 2012. And they had a dreadful record against the Southern Hemisphere nations, particularly Australia, I um, mean, comfortably the worst of the home nations, even since that revival. And of course, everybody loses New Zealand, so they're hardly alone in that. So what a special relationship? Now, as we know from other fields, so-called special relationships are not necessarily equal. And they may even be a fantasy on the part of the junior partner. 
Um, sport, of course, makes it slightly hard to fantasise because you have the hard reality of results. And certainly talking to older New Zealanders who remember Wales um, as a worthy adversary, they really rather like Wales to be worth beating again. Um, there's an awareness of history which underpins this. There was a test match in 2005 when there was not wasn't originally on the schedule, since clearly both nations would want to play to celebrate the centenary of the 1905 match. Wales was the only nation to vote against the decision to strip New Zealand of co-hosting rights to the 2003 World Cup. And of course we have the relationship through coaching. Wales has had coaches in New Zealand for 16 of the last 19 years. Two of them have returned home to New Zealand to coach the All Blacks and the third Warren Gatland may follow, and I have to say I would I'd rather guess that he won't. Um, against that, the rather more hard-headed issue of who gets invited to New Zealand and where they play. And Wales hadn't clearly been regarded as the most favoured visitors. In 2003, Wales played at Hamilton, um, which was regarded very much as a second-ranked venue in a year in which England played at Wellington. And fair enough, England beat the All Blacks and won the World Cup that year, so one couldn't really argue. The attention at ha the attendance at Hamilton, which we one might have thought this is fairly much for a red letter day, because it doesn't get huge numbers of internationals, was 25,200. The ground did not quite sell, which is the one where the Lions are playing tomorrow morning, did not quite sell out. 2010, matches were played at Dunedin, which is now very much the least of the four traditional venues. Didn't get a Lions Fest in 2005 even getting the one this time, and Hamilton again. Last year, we did at least get back to Auckland and Wellington, as well as Dunedin in the three test series. But I think there's now a limited sense that Wales is special, or that the New Zealand public are very excited to see them. So, when, to conclude on a wholly speculative note, as if the last few minutes haven't been fairly speculative, might the run end. Now it's logical to assume that at some point the All Blacks will drop from the current ridiculously high levels of performance they've maintained over a remarkably long time now. Um, Ireland finally broke through after 111 years of trying last autumn in Chicago and three or four years ago got much closer than Wales have been since 1978. And it's not as if Ireland are that much better than Wales if at all. I know this doesn't always work as logic, but you look at what the Irish have achieved against the All Blacks and you think, well, if they can do it, why can't we? They play each other much more frequently, 22 times in the last 30 years. Of course, by definition, that increases the chances um, of a Welsh win, but it also means that All Black superiority and maybe a sort of ingrained belief that they can't be beaten gets rubbed in on a regular basis. Uh, when Blevin Williams wrote the foreword to Dragons and All Blacks in 2003, um, he said the one distinction he'd very much like to lose was that of being the last captain of Wales to beat New Zealand. Uh, Blevin died in 2009, still very much himself till shortly before the end, but that wish unfulfilled. Now I sometimes point out to students that a lot of bad predictions, particularly in sport, are based on the assumption that current trends will continue infinitely. But in fact, while history doesn't tell us what will happen, the one thing is it tells us is that that won't. But you do begin to wonder. Now, my father was 23 when Wales beat New Zealand in 1953. He lived another 63 years and two weeks. Died this January without seeing it happen again. I was born six years after this game, give or take a couple of weeks. Um, I'm 57 and beginning to wonder if Wales will win in my lifetime. And that's not just because that last year's cancer, di cancer diagnosis has probably slightly reduced my chance of living to be 100. And it's hard not to be reminded of what the Australian writer Brian Matthews said about supporting St Kilda Australian Rules Football Club, who have one championship in their entire history, but two cricketing immortals since both Shane Warne and Keith Miller played for them. He said that support supporting St Kilda taught him the meaning of life which is struggle, defeat and hope springing eternal. So who knows, but I'm not holding my breath. <laughs>